2018, you write this book, 15 million plus copies later, uh, multiple, multiple countries translated into different languages. Uh, what have you observed as the most surprising thing that people have taken away from your book? In other words, you know, you're trying to teach people, it seems, uh, how to have better habits, how to, you know, eat the elephant one tiny bite at a time. It's That's been tremendous insight for me, not being overwhelmed and doing my thing. But what have you observed, just anecdotally heard other people talk about how the book has benefited them? It's really gratifying to write something, to have people find it useful. You know, I still consider it to be kind of like a minor miracle that anybody is paying attention. Um, you know, like you just, you write this stuff on your blog and then now all of a sudden I'll see a picture on Instagram of somebody in India or Dubai or Australia reading it. And you're like, how did the idea even get over there? You know, I mean, it's kind of, so it's, it's sort of unbelievable that it's, it's spread the way that it has. Um, you know, I tried really hard to make every idea in the book useful. And so the first draft of Atomic Habits was like 710 pages and the finished version is 250. And I, I kind of wanted the opposite problem that a lot of business books have. You know, you hear that classic crit critique, which is this could have been a blog post basically. And so I, you know, I was like, well, let me start by writing way too much and then I'll just cut out everything that isn't excellent. And um, I think it worked well. And I, I do think that... Um, I, or at least I hope that a lot of the ideas in the book are really genuinely useful. And I, one nice thing is that when I look at feedback, whether it comes in through social media, or if you look at reviews on Amazon or Goodreads, people mention different things. It's not like it was just one idea and that's the thing that stuck with everybody. Like different people pull different things out of the book. And that I feel like is a really nice thing because I don't, my stance is that there actually is no one way to build better habits. There are many ways. And my job is not to tell you like the way to do it. My job is to try to empower you and equip you with a broader tool set. And if you have a bigger toolkit, then you're better positioned to figure out which strategy works for you. Now, having said all of that, um, I would say the one thing that has surprised me is that there's there was a lot that was already written about breaking things down, making them small, and about getting better results. And that's usually the thing that we talk about when we talk about habits. Hey, habits will help you make more money or be productive or get fit or, you know, reduce stress. And it's true that habits can do those things. But one of the biggest things that people gravitated to from Atomic Habits is this concept that every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. So it's that your habits are how you embody and shape your identity, not necessarily the focus on results. Now there's still a lot in the book about driving better results, but that has been interesting. I think to see is that really what a lot of people have gravitated to what the aha moment was for many readers was when they made this shift from worrying about their results or using their habits to drive better results. And instead asking who is the type of person I wish to become, you know, how do my habits reinforce that? How do my habits cast a vote for being a type of a certain type of person? And then trusting that if I build that identity and foster that identity, that the results will kind of come along the way. So I would say that's probably been the biggest surprise. Yeah. Can I tell you mine? Uh, can I give you a little testimonial? Uh, well, so I bought the book just like the rest of the world. Um, and during that time, I was having a bit of a health crisis. I mean, it wasn't uh, the kind of crisis that you went through with your injury, but um, I was, you know, 30 something and finding myself having debilitating headaches. And I really thought, oh shoot, like, do I have a brain tumor? Am I dying? So I went got all the health checks. It turned out everything was fine, um, but I was just having these really uncurable headaches. Um, I bought your book, I started reading it. Uh, I went down a path of learning that I needed to change my diet and nutrition and sleep habits and all that thing. And the number one takeaway from the book, if I could just net net, it was that. It was like the habits that you uh, create help you become the person that you want to become. And so for me, there was lots of triggers causing my own problems. One of them was eating poorly. Uh, specifically, I, I had a sweet tooth. Um, and I had to say, because it was really hard. I, I was addicted to sweets. Like 
in my glove box, you could find a little box of hot tamales or in my, uh, I would just have little snacks stashed everywhere. I could get down a sleeve of Oreos before you even blink. Like I was just bad, uh, just a sweet fiend. And so when I read that in your book, I thought I'm someone who doesn't eat sweets anymore. That's just who I am. I am someone who doesn't eat sweets and I'm someone who goes to bed on time. And I am someone, not like I don't do that, but it's like, this is who I am. This is my identity. This is who I, I want to become. That helped me so much, James. I can't thank you enough. That just so, so crystallized uh, what I needed to do. And I just want to say thank you. It was amazing. So thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, I'm glad it was helpful. You know, that's like I said, that's the whole, the whole point is to try to be useful. So anytime, anytime somebody finds it helpful, I think it's just the, the best. So thanks for sharing that. And I've stayed on that path, thanks to that advice, uh, that process. I, I haven't uh, binged or, or you know gone back uh, since 2018. So I've been on this clear path for what, six, going on seven years. So um, how about you? Are there any non-negotiables in your life? You know, talk about routines, food systems, et cetera. What are some of these non-negotiables for you? There were before I had kids. Um, I... <laughs> I uh... I, you know, so there are, there are some things that if you just look at, uh, my behavior, then you're like, well, even if he says it's non-negotiable, uh, it says it's negotiable. It must be pretty non-negotiable. Like I've never missed an issue three, two, one, for example. So that's been going on for, you know, five years and, you know, comes out every week. So clearly that's something that is non-negotiable. Um, I've been training consistently in the gym for about 15 years now, but I have had periods, you know, post a baby being born or, uh, you know, I had my elbow operating on at one point or well, whatever. There's just like stuff that I've had pockets of a month or two where I haven't done it, but I don't know that I've ever gone like say eight weeks without getting a workout in. Um, so, you know, I've had, I've had pockets where it's been down, but, uh, for the most part, I've been pretty consistent for a decade plus. Um, other than that, I would say that it's more project based. So here's a, this actually reveals, I think, an interesting insight about habits, which is a lot of the time when I talk to readers about habits, so I'll do a keynote or something and people, you know, ask questions afterward. Um, what you realize is that in a lot of people's minds, even if they don't say this explicitly, what they think it means to be successful with a habit is they would pick a habit and they'd start doing it and then they're going to do it forever until they die. Like that, that's what they would think it would mean to be successful. And I actually think it's quite rare that you would have a habit that would fall into that category. I think most of the great habits that will serve you really well throughout your life, they probably have a season or even if they don't have a season where you just never do it again, they have a season for that shape that they take. So let's take my writing habit, for example. Um, you know, I mentioned for the first couple of years, for the first three plus years, I wrote a new article every Monday and Thursday. So that was the shape of that habit at that time. And it worked really well for me. And then I signed the book deal and I spent the next three years writing Atomic Habits. And the, the writing habit needed to change shape in that period. And so I wasn't publishing every Monday and Thursday. I was publishing one new article and then I would republish an old article uh, once a week. So I, you know, and then I, after a while, I switched to just once a week. So it, you know, it shifted. And then starting in 2019, after the book came out and I'm kind of doing a book tour and doing a lot of events and a bunch of other stuff, um, I started publishing 321. And so now it's not an article, it's a shorter newsletter and that's once a week. And I have had a consistent writing habit for the last, you know, 12 plus years. So I think in general, we would probably say I do a pretty good job with my writing habit. But if I was judging myself off of, oh, I don't publish articles twice a week anymore, you know, I, I would feel bad about it. And I think um, you need to have at least enough flexibility that you can figure out the shape that your habit needs for the current season that you're in. And so this interesting insight arises, which is that the way to be consistent is actually to be adaptable. You know, we often talk about consistency as discipline, stubbornness, the willingness to grit through it no matter what the situation has. Um, but in reality, what it often means is adapting. If you don't have enough time, you scale it down. If you don't have much energy, you do the easy version. You know, you like figure out a way to not throw up a zero for that day 
and to show up even if it's smaller than what you ultimately hope to do. And if you're good at being adaptable, then you maintain the habit. And if you maintain the habit, then all you need is time. And so um, flexibility and adaptability, I think, are kind of a big part of that discussion. I like that because then that also helps us avoid sort of the self-sabotage, which is, you, you know, inevitable if we feel like we're failing and then we start beating ourselves up and then, you know, it's, you know, I was speaking for myself, it sort of becomes this, you know, uh, spiral and you're just like, well, fuck it then. <laughs> like, you sort of 